fans of the History Guy know that I am a collector. For example, these are just a few of my toy cannons. And probably the most obvious part is my hat collection. I do collect military hats, and to be honest, I would only call myself a casual collector. I know a lot of people who collect much more and are more expert than I am. But I do enjoy collecting, and I see it as part of my general love for history. Each item has a story. But one of the most enjoyable parts of collecting is trying to collect full sets, whether that's baseball cards or decorative plates or state quarters, or in this case, a full set of the five colors of U.S. Navy officer caps from the Second World War. That's right, the Navy had five different colors for essentially the same hat, and all of those colors do represent some things about the odd time of the Second World War, but it also just represents changing styles and the evolution of the United States Navy uniform. But before we get to why there were five different colors of hats, let's talk a little bit about military hats, because a Navy veteran will get mad that I call something like this a hat. According to most people who served in the Navy, this is called a cover. In fact, one website on military hat etiquette opined that military hats are never called hats. They are only referred to as covers. But it's not clear how or why the military started using cover as a generic term for a hat. The word cover itself is derived from the old French word couvrir, used as early as the mid-12th century and meaning to protect or conceal. The term has evolved over time to have a broad and diverse meaning. Cover can mean simply putting one thing over another, but it can also mean to spread something completely over a surface. Putting collateral of equal value to something risk in a wager is called covering a bat. The use of the term to refer to news reporting on a subject originated from newspaper reporting on football in the early 1900s. But something close to the original meaning was applied to the game itself once the forward pass was invented and defenders had to cover a receiver. The meaning to pass or travel over, that is to cover ground, was in use early in the 19th century, whereas using the word to mean taking the place of an absent workmate became popularized in the 1970s. For military use, cover can mean anything that physically protects you from enemy fire, seeking cover, but can also mean aiming at someone to cover an area in case the enemy moves through it, or to provide covering fire to deter them from shooting back. That term is also applied to protecting the vulnerable escape route, covering the rear. But the etymology of the use of the term in the military to refer to as a hat is not clear. One veteran opined on a military website that it likely came when some sergeant was telling a soldier to cover their head when artillery was raining down. And that's about as likely an explanation as any. In fact, the use of the term cover instead of hat or cap is largely a U.S. thing and not commonly used elsewhere. There's disagreement over where and why this line started, but despite the apparently nearly universal use of the term in the U.S. military today, a review of things like Army Magazine suggests that it is relatively new, developing sometime after the Second World War. The use of the word cover is actually slang. It's not officially used in military regulations, although it's common enough that many official military websites will use the term cover, but according to U.S. Navy regulations, this is actually called a military-style cap. Which finally leads to the question of why the Navy needs so many colors for essentially the same hat. Early U.S. naval uniforms stressed the cocked hat, a bicorn or tricorn for officers. In fact, versions of the cocked hat were still part of the Navy uniform until 1947. The still-used pattern of blue and gold for naval uniforms, that is a blue uniform with gold decorations, was first established in 1802. The first time the uniform standards included something similar to these combination covers was in 1830. That was used with what was called the undress uniform and was called a blue cap or a round hat. As the name implies, the hats were made of blue cloth to match the officer's coat. The round topped hat with a short brim or peak included gold lace bands for senior officers, which was the predecessor to the gold chin strap still used on U.S. Naval officer hats today. As the fashion changed and the uniform evolved, the hat grew rounder at the bell. By 1898, the more rounded hat, gold chin strap, navy emblem with eagle and anchors, the history of the badge might be covered more fully in a future episode, was fully recognizable as a precursor to the combination cover you see today. Activities in the Far East and acquisition of Pacific interest resulted in the need for a tropical uniform, and regulations for a service dress white uniform were released in 1886. Thus the Navy had, at the outset of the 20th century, just two of these five colors among their official uniform hats. The blue hat, worn with the blue uniform, and a white version, worn with the white tropical uniform. But a new technology added more color. In 1910, pilot Eugene Eli took off from a modified deck of the scout cruiser USS Birmingham in his Curtis Model 4 Pusher aircraft. In 1911, he landed on the modified deck of the armored cruiser USS Pennsylvania the first landing of a fixed-wing aircraft on a warship in history. As a result of these demonstrations, the Navy started buying a handful of aircraft, and naval aviation was born. 
Among the changes brought by this change in military technology, the navy white and blue service uniforms were demonstrated to be impractical for aviation officers. Khaki, a more practical color that had been invented by the British in India in the 1840s when soldiers dyed white uniform items with mud to blend in with the scenery, was used then by U.S. Marines and was more practical for the rigors and mess of aviation machines. In 1912, the Navy approved the first use of a khaki uniform for naval officers, but it was only khaki pants and it was only authorized for naval aviators. During the Great War, naval aviation grew quickly. At the outset of the war, the U.S. had a total of 48 naval aviators. As the war progressed and naval aviation took on a broader role, largely hunting U-boats, the service expanded to more than 6,700 aviators and overall more than 30,000 personnel. As the service was expanding in June of 1917, a full khaki summer dress uniform was approved for naval aviators. It included a cap, the first khaki cap in the Navy uniform regulations. But it also became clear that the cloth for the khaki uniform was not suitable for winter, and a winter uniform made from the forest green color used in the marine dress uniforms was also approved. The uniform also included a matching colored hat. While it was officially forest green, it was commonly called aviation green. Now, naval aviators had their own distinct uniforms, and the Navy had four colors of the same hat. The color was authorized until 1922 when it was removed from the regulations, but then, due to the outcry from naval aviators, the forest green hat was reauthorized in 1925. The khaki turned out to be very practical. In 1931, the use of the khaki uniform was extended to those serving aboard submarines. Shortly after Pearl Harbor, the uniform was approved for officers in regular duty. While the khaki uniform was used generally during the war, it was actually, for most of the Navy, newly authorized at the outset of the war. And that brings us to the fifth and most obscure color for the Navy dress uniform, a color that has been forever associated with one particular naval officer. Ernest King was born in Ohio in 1878 and graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy in 1901. While still a cadet, he served aboard the protected cruiser USS San Francisco during the Spanish-American War. He served in the surface fleet and then the submarine force, where he designed the dolphin symbol used on the submarine warfare insignia. He then moved to naval aviation, where as a captain he trained and received his wings in May of 1927. He moved up the ranks and in 1941 was made an admiral and was commander-in-chief of the Atlantic Fleet. After Pearl Harbor, he was promoted to the position commander-in-chief of the U.S. Fleet, with operational command over the Atlantic, Pacific, and Asiatic fleets. He continued to hold that command when, in February 1942, he was also appointed Chief of Naval Operations. Ernest King impacted many things in his tenure, and there are various complaints and criticisms of his work, but one of his most obscure impacts was a new uniform. If you grew up on World War II movies like I did, you might think the Navy always fought in khaki, but remember the khaki uniform was only authorized outside of the Aviation and Submarine Service in 1941. It was, at the time, brand new, and Ernest King didn't much like it. It's not completely clear why he so disliked the khaki uniform, but most accounts merely say that he thought the color looked like a land forces color and not a navy color, although some accounts say it was his wife who disliked the color as unfashionable. King saw the khaki as a stopgap only and set about to find a new uniform. Reportedly inspired by the blue-gray uniform of Britain's RAF, he decided on a gray uniform. In April 1943, he proposed adopting the gray uniform to the Secretary of the Navy arguing that such a uniform would be more suitable for our present shipboard camouflage. That is, ships were gray, not khaki, so King saw a gray uniform as better camouflage on the ship. The gray color, which was never consistent with examples in multiple hues, was actually officially called battleship gray, although it is also sometimes described as slate gray, and somewhat derisively by officers who didn't like it, Ernest King gray. King's vision was to replace the khaki and aviation green with gray, saving white and blue uniforms for formal dress. One of the interesting things about the battleship gray uniform is that it was supposed to have plastic buttons instead of the gilt brass buttons, black plastic, and also it was supposed to have stitched emblems on it, stitched in black rather than the gold braid that was commonly used. Ostensibly, that was to save on the use of metals so that we could preserve wartime metals, and that applied to the hat as well. The hat was supposed to have, instead of the brass buttons on the side and the gold chin strap, was supposed to have black plastic buttons and a black chin strap. So why does this hat have gilt buttons and a gold strap? Officially, the standard buttons and strap were allowed as a transition period. Unofficially, Admiral Chester Nimitz, who was the commander-in-chief in the Pacific, told the story that was later related in a biography of him. At a wartime meeting in San Francisco, Nimitz and King had just left a restaurant. It was raining, so they had coats on with no rank insignia. 
Nimitz wore the khaki cap with gold buttons and strap, while King was wearing his gray hat with black buttons and strap. A reporter, seeing all the gold on Nimitz's hat, pushed right past King, mistaking him for a petty officer. The reporter said to the five-star Admiral of the Fleet, Out of my way, Chief! I want to get a picture of Admiral Nimitz! King then changed the regulations to allow wearing gilt buttons and the gold chin strap on the gray uniform. In 1944, King ordered the gilt button be replaced with the black strap and buttons, but the order was widely ignored. So what happened to the gray uniform? While King did not like the khaki, Nimitz did not like the gray. Again, it's not clear why, but he argued that the khaki was more practical in the Pacific, where he commanded. Nimitz discouraged the use of the gray uniform in the Pacific. In December 1945, King retired, and Nimitz replaced him as Chief of Naval Operations, and the battleship gray uniform lost its most important supporter. The gray uniform was officially fully retired in 1949 since it was only official for six years, was barely worn by line officers in the Pacific and only a little bit by line officers in the Atlantic, and mostly only worn by those officers who were serving near Admiral King in Washington, D.C., the gray hats and uniforms are relatively rare and highly prized by collectors. So what happened to all these five colors? Well, the original idea was to wear the blue hat with the winter blue dress and the white hat with the summer white. By the Second World War, the white hat was authorized to wear with the blue uniform, but the blue hat was never authorized to be worn with the summer whites. To simplify the uniform and save on cost for officers, the blue cap was dropped in 1956 as unnecessary. Aviation green survived until 2010 when it was dropped as the Navy wanted to again simplify the uniform. Now the Navy only retains two colors of combination covers, the white to wear with the various versions of more formal dress uniforms, and the khaki to wear with the service uniform. Officers can also use the simpler overseas cap with the service uniform, and the khaki military-style cap is seen less and less today. There's so much more to talk about with U.S. Naval combination covers and peaked hats. There's, of course, all the ones that have been authorized for the petty officers and warrant officers and the hats for the other maritime services like the Coast Guard and the United States Merchant Marine or the development of the various cap badges over time. But talking about why we had five colors for the U.S. Navy hat is enough for this one episode. I do know something about all of these hats. I have some history on them. The forest green hat, for example, still has the original sticker inside. This originally sold for $15. And this navy blue hat here was worn by an officer who served at the Naval Supply Depot in Clearfield, Utah, which History Guy fans will recognize as the subject of the very first episode of the History Guy. One of the reasons that I like collecting things is that every single one of these is a bit of history. And even the color of uniforms that have long since become obsolete can be history that deserves to be remembered. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.